All praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Seek His forgiveness, his guidance, and His assistance. And we take refuge with Him from the evil within our souls and from the consequences of our misdeeds. Whoever Allah gives guidance to, that can mislead, and whoever He misleads, that can guide. I testify there's nothing in no one worthy of worship besides Allah alone. He has no partners, and I testify that Muhammad, the son of Abdullah, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, is a servant and messenger. We ask Allah to grant him peace and extend him our salutations on this blessed day during this blessed month. Just as we ask him to grant peace to his family members, companions, and all of those who follow goodness and exhibit goodwill to the meeting and the reckoning of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before beginning, I'd just like to further encourage all of us to take advantage of the time that we have remaining. Alhamdulillah, that um, it's about halfway point in the month of Ramadan. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He accept your fast, that He accepts your prayers, your recitation and reading of the Quran, your standing at night, your charity, all your good, good works during this month of Ramadan. It is a blessed season and we should uh, utilize it as an opportunity to um, reset our spiritual clock or our moral compass uh, in hopes that beyond this month Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow for us to carry the light of the blessing and the blessing of Ramadan with us uh, uh, as we return to our normal activities, inshallah. That is, of course, with the condition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us life beyond the month. And may Allah, He forgives those of those who have passed away during this blessed month and grant them Jannah. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was a great Sahabi. <clears throat> he was one of the first people to accept Islam in Mecca. As a matter of fact, he was one of about six Muslims, of the very first Muslims in Mecca. Of course, being uh, among the Prophet himself, our mother Khadija bin Khawaid, um, Ali bin Abi Talib, Abu Bakr Siddiq, and Zayd bin Haritha. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with them. Wa sallallahu alayhi ala rasulih. <laughs> Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was known as Ibn Umi Abd. He was known as this among the uh, Quraysh and the Mushrikeen, um, identified um, with his mother, even though his father was known as well. Uh, but Ab Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was the very first Sahabi to actually come out publicly and recite the Quran. Uh, in the uh, midst of the Mushrikeen. Uh, uh, after the Prophet Sallallahu had done it, he was the very first of them to do so. And on one particular occasion, the Sahaba were sitting around and they were um, wondering if it may be possible for them to bring this message to the Mushrikeen. This is before the Prophet Sallallahu was given the command to actually publicly call his people, but 
you know, they have an idea. They say, is there a man, a brave man, a brave man among, among us who would go out to the Kaaba and recite the Quran so the king can hear it? And no one wanted to take it on, but Abdullah ibn Masood was young, a very young man, and he says, I'll do it. So they say, well, no, 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 we don't want you to do it because you don't have a tribe to protect you. He wasn't a member of the Quraysh. He was, his father himself was one who migrated there. He was had an alliance with one of the clans in Mecca. You know, so if you didn't, if you simply had an alliance when times of persecution like this occurred, you really didn't have the tribe's protection, even the one that you had the alliance with. And so they were fearful of that he would become, get hurt. He said, "No, I'll do it." So he goes to the Kaaba and he spots the Mushrikeen and their gatherings and. The, he starts, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, ar-Rahman, allam al-Qur'an, khalaq al-Inzan, he starts reciting. So Mushrikeen are looking at him, and they hear something, but they really don't know exactly what they're saying. They say, well, what is this little guy doing? What is he saying over there? And they say, well, yeah, I think he's saying some of that stuff that Muhammad's like, some of them, well, of course, they don't say so, like, some of them that Muhammad brought. And once they realized this is what he was doing, they attacked him and they punched him in his face and they drive him away. And he comes back to the Muslims and they say, well, this is what we feared would happen to you. And they said, I swear to God, their hits, they were like what we would say today. It's like, you know, it was like being hit by a little girl, right? It really didn't mean anything to him. He said, I'll go out tomorrow again, once again, if you want me to. They said, no, 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 don't do that. But anyway, Abdullah bin Mas'ud was a very important Sahabi, not only because of the courage, but also because of his knowledge. That Abdullah bin Mas'ud, <coughs> um, he was a very, very private, and special student of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And sometimes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would even ask him to recite the Quran for him. And he would say, well, you want me to recite? You're the one who would reveal to you what we recited to you? And then the Prophet would say, yes, I like to have others recited to me. So Abdullah al Masood would recite for the Prophet as well. Um, Abdullah al Masood was reported to have said later in his life a boasting of his knowledge. Of course, with no sort of uh, arrogance, he would say that there's not a single verse of this Quran that was revealed except that I know when it was revealed, where it was revealed, and with regard to what incident it was revealed. And of course, word that reached the Sahaba and no one objected. They acknowledged the knowledge of, and of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. At any rate, I begin with this short story about him because I want to share with you a quote from him about the Qur'an itself. It's reported to have said, إِذَا سَمِعْتَ اللَّهَ يَقُولُوا يَا إِيهَا لَذِينَ آمَنُوا فَأَرْعِهَا سَمْعَكَ It said, any time you hear Allah say, oh, you who believe, then give it your full attention. Give it your full attention. فَإِنَّهُ خَيْرٌ يَأْمُرُ بِهِ وَشَرًا يَنْهَا عَنْهُ Because it is either good that he is ordered, ordering you to do, or it is evil that he is forbidding you from committing. So anytime Allah says, oh you believe, give it your attention. And all throughout this book, Kitab Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over and over and over says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amnu, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amnu, sometimes, hey, Ya ayyuhal nas, sometimes, Ya ayyuhal nabi, Ya Ahli Kitab. But throughout the Quran, Allah, He is calling on the believers. Oh, you who believe, pay attention to what I'm about to say. It's Taqullah. Get half Taqwa from Allah. Take a shield against Allah's punishment. Be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, so, right away from the very beginning, the very first thing that Allah typically will call us to after getting our attention is ittaqullah have consciousness and awareness for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala why? because taqwa is the key 
to unlocking the secrets of the Quran. If you are not a person of taqwa, then you really can't do that. You really can't do that. The Quran teaches us that, that it's a hudan al-muttaqin, that is a guidance for humanity. And even in the verse in Baqarah, which begins the discussion of fasting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, kutiba alaykum usiyamu, kama kutiba ala ladina min qabikum, la'allahum tattakum. That fasting, not the fast of Ramadan, but fasting has been prescribed for you, has been ordained for you, as it was ordained for those before you, la'allahum tattakum, in order that you achieve taqwa. What is taqwa? Taqwa is defined generally as two fundamental things. One is the fulfillment of Allah's commandments and the avoidance of His prohibitions. Sometimes the commandments and prohibitions are related to outward acts. Some of them are inward acts. Things, prohibitions of the heart. Things that your heart are expected to comply with as well. And that in itself is a, the summary of what taqwa is fundamentally. And the scholars, they say to us, or they tell us that that it's easier for one to fulfill Allah's commandments than for one to uh, avoid Allah's prohibitions. Right? Isn't that the case? Right? We're all fasting. Alhamdulillah, it's easy to fast and everybody else is fasting, right? Allah says, don't eat. Don't drink. Don't approach your spouses. Right? During the daytime, right? Sometimes that can be hard. All of those, or some of those, can be hard, very really difficult, right? But it's, but there's great rewards in avoiding the prohibitions of Allah subhanahu wa taala. And this is simply, and because I'm actually on this issue of prohibitions, it, it wants to clear up a misunderstanding that I come across from time to time. There's certain, unfortunately, it's a minority of Muslims who would think that simply because a woman is unable to fast and pray. Right, certain times that that itself means that um, that men themselves have a particular advantage over them with regard to the number of acts of worship uh, that they are to do. And thinking that because of the increase in numbers, it is it necessarily an increase in closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But a woman can pray and fast if she wanted to, right? You see, he said, you know, I don't care what. The, the, the law says, I'm going to fast anyway, I'm going to pray anyway, even though I have my cycle, right? But she avoids the prohibition, right? And so the prohibition itself, there's greater reward in avoiding the prohibition than fulfilling the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But at any rate, throughout the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling us to be conscious of Him, to be people of taqwa. And He tells us elsewhere, wa ta'ala nu ala birdi wa taqwa. And cooperate in a bill, which is righteousness in its broadest sense, and taqwa. Or one way you can see this is that taqwa itself is a subcategory of bill. Or taqwa is a means to a bill. And bill itself is a means to something beyond, beyond, beyond that. This is why the Prophet said, Alaikum the Sidq in the Sidqa Yahdi in the Bill. Said, bound yourselves to honesty. Bound yourself to honesty. Bound yourself to honesty. Because honesty it leads to Bill. But in the Birra Yahdi in the Jannah. And the Birra it leads to Jannah. Birra or righteousness in its most general sense, it leads to Jannah. And in one narration, ila rib Allah, it leads to God's satisfaction. That the Prophet has come to us not as a legalist per se, but as someone to give us a whole bunch of rules, do's and don'ts. We know that. Especially when it comes to like basic financial transactions. A caller Abu Bakr ibn Arabi says that that there actually are about 56 financial transactions which are prohibited. All others are permissible. That the presumptive ruling. So basically you can count the number of things actually prohibited. Everything else, the, the things that are permitted are much more, many more than the things that are forbidden. But the Prophet of his ultimate mission was to 
help us to perfect our, uh, our humanity, to show us how we were to perfect our humanity. And this is why he said in the famous hadith, I have been sent for nothing more than to perfect uh, noble characteristics or noble conduct, or the, the noble characteristics of akhlaq or conduct and behavior. And in other narrations, I have been sent as nothing more than as, as a teacher, mu'allim. And mu'allim is not simply someone who, as we would generally understand to be a teacher, and was standing in a classroom teaching you a math problem, but a mu'allim is someone who leaves an impression on your heart. Who leaves, who makes a mark on the individual. Ma'allam, this is why in the Arabic language, ta'leem not only means instruction, it means actually leave a trace or a mark or a sign on someone. To leave an alama on something. And this is why every ayah is an alama, a signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of them, they point to Allah's existence, or point to Allah's power, or Allah's life, among other things. That, that, that is fundamentally the role of the teacher is to leave this, make this mark and impression on the individual. <inaudible> I will not sit as a one to, call, to curse others. <inaudible> I have been sent as an inviter and as a, as a mercy. That is what the Prophet ﷺ was sent as. And that is to say the point fundamentally is simply that that we as people we know that there's a difference between one who, who says something and another who acts upon what they say. That you walk your talk. That we don't respect people who say things and they, and they don't do others. That you may be in a position of prestige. You may have a prestigious career. You may be a great politician or athlete or an entertainer uh, or you may be a great educator right but at the end of the day what matters to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just how good of a person you are but how do we know you're a good person by the way that you treat others by the way that you talk to others and that it not only it, it, it's not only talking about the people that you come in contact you know occasionally like in the message Right at your, your home, with your spouse, with your children, with your peers, with your neighbors, with your cousins, your aunts, your uncles. How do you talk to them? How do you treat them? Are you charitable towards them? Right? And this is fundamentally what all learning is all about. It's about perfecting your humanity. That is what Ramadan and fasting are all about, are about perfecting our humanity. It's not just simply a thing that Muslims do, right? It's just one of our customs, right? Yeah, it is a custom, right? But it's also worship, but it has a goal. The goal is to perfect our humanity, perfect our conduct. And if we put too much reliance on our actions, we're told that it is a type of subtle idolatry. That is even to the extent that if you were to believe that Allah has to give me Jannah. Look how many prayers I've made one time. Look how many uh, months of Ramadan I've fasted. Look how many times I have uh, made Hajj. Look how much charity I have given. Allah has to give me Jannah. Allah doesn't have to do anything. He doesn't have to do anything for you. And, and, and you see another person who may do, may do none of those different things. None of those things. You say, Allah has to put that person in the hellfire. No, Allah does not have to do anything that you want for him to do. That is only out of his grace that he does it. He gives you a promise. Of course, Allah doesn't break his promise. But this is not a thing where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is compelled to do anything. And so when you think, okay, because I did this many different things, this type of different acts, that Allah is going to guarantee, but automatically give me what I, I'm seeking that we have to make sure, be very careful about this because we can be placing too much reliance on the act itself. Too much reliance on the act itself. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to come out in a certain condition. 
He wants us to be certain types of people. He wants us to be people who want to do good even when we don't have the opportunity to do so. He wants us to be people who don't want to do to do bad things even when we have the opportunity to do so. That is what he wants us to become. People of virtue. People of virtue. And this state is what we call a birth. A birth of, of, of supreme and, and universal Righteousness, and this is what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He teaches in the Quran. He says, "Leis al birra and to leis al birra and to wal wujuha kum kibla al mashrik mashriki wal maghribi wal akinna birra man aman billahi yom al akhir ma malakhi wa kitabi wa nabiyin." That bir, it is not bir that you turn your faces to east or west, but it is bir those who believe in Allah and and, and the last day, uh, the angels, the messengers, uh, and, and the books. وَآتَ الْمَالَ عَلَى حُبِّهِ ذَوَ الْقُرْبَى وَالْيَتَامَى وَالْمَسَاكِينِ وَالْمَسَابِينِ 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 And gives wealth out of Islam, out of love for him, to relatives, to the orphans, to the poor, to, in, in, the, in the way of set, in order to set free slaves, and to those who ask, and the traveler. وَأَقَامُ الصَّلَاةَ وَأَقَامُ الصَّلَاةَ وَأَعْتِ الزَّكَاةَ وَالْمُفُورِ بِأَحْدِهِمِ إِذَا أَحَدُوا And establishes a prayer and pays the zakat and fulfills one's commitments when they make those commitments. وَالصَّابِرِينَ فِي الْبَأْسَاءِ وَالْدَرَّاءِ وَحِينَ الْبَأْسِ And those who are endured during times of, of poverty and at times of illness and in, uh, on the battlefield. أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ those are the true and honest ones. But and they are the muftakun, the people of taqwa. Those who the people of taqwa are. But here you notice that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes this distinction between we call goals and means. That bir is the goal. But really it is a but even as a goal of taqwa, that bir is not the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is Allah's satisfaction. And, but we should pursue both taqwa and bir. And so the Quran tells us, "Ta'awwalun ala bir wa taqwa." Cooperate upon a bir and upon taqwa. All that we do is about perfecting our humanity. And as I said, it is about modeling behavior with our peers, our neighbors, and all of those around us. It's not just about prestige, education, success in business, success in life, and entertainment, and careers, among other things. That is about perfecting our humanity, becoming better people, and the best way to know how good of people we are is reflect upon how we treat those around us. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the ability to achieve a better, a total complete righteousness in this life before we leave this world. Uh, and we ask him to forgive us for our sins and set our, our feet uh, straight upon his path. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah alayhi wa lakum wa risa al muslimin wa muslimat. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشهر الأنبياء سيد المسلمين النبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he taught us that the beauty of the خلق righteousness is beauty of conduct or beauty in conduct. And he also said أَتْمَلُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِمَانًا إِمَانًا سَنَمُ خَلَقَ that the believers with the most complete faith are those who have the most beautiful of character. The word Bibb is interesting, especially when we compare it to its cognates. That we have in the Arabic language a number of words which relate to this. And so one word al is the opposite of al the land as opposed to the sea. And every one of the words that are connected with Bilk indicate what the Arabs call a tawassur, a type of expansion or an opening up for others. Because the land itself is spacious and expands enough for people to live upon. 
So Allah refers to the land as al -Bak. He refers to the most expensive and perhaps the most utilized of all staples, wheat as a book, which also connects with it to the word al -Bak. Allah, one of his names is al -Bak, which means that mutawassiru fi thawab is the one who proliferates rewards. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He grants so many different opportunities to reward us. That He gives us the fara'at, compulsory acts. And He gives us the voluntary acts. And then He rewards each act according to a different type of criteria. Some acts He only gives us 1.4. Some He gives us 10.4. Some He gives 700.4. Some of them He leaves the rewards for us to find out Yom al -Qiyama. In particular, the fast, as it said in some hadith, that the fast, this reward is greater than 700, but exactly how much we'll find out when we meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah, also beyond that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He creates seasons for a greater reward. Ramadan, goodness in Ramadan is not like doing things outside of the month of Ramadan. That's the same thing for the sacred months of Islam. Right? Just as sin as well during these months is considered to be, by many of the scholars, to be greater, more severe than they are outside of these months. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created certain places where it magnifies deeds for us, like Mecca, right? Salat in the Haram is not like Salat here or the, or the uh, Masjid Nabawi. So at any rate, Allah Zabak is one of his names, that he is one who proliferates reward, that he gives us expansion and space and opportunity to a mass reward on so many different levels. That the gates of Jahannam are seven, the gates of Jannah are eight, which means there are more opportunities for us to gain closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the human being also is called a barq at times. And the human being is referred to as a barq, or a person who is a barq, is an individual who is a mutawassir fi ta'at, a person who proliferates acts of obedience and worship. How much worship are we committed to? How much worship do we do on a regular basis? And I'm not only talking about, again, the Salah and our Zakat al fitr or our regular charity, right, or the fast of Ramadan. But how often do you smile on your brother or your sister's face? How often do you treat your family to a, to a happy day or a day out and you enjoy yourself? How often do you lower your tone when you talk to one another? How, how, how hard do you try not to be abrasive to others? How often do you uh, share a kind word or a kind experience with someone else? How often do you console someone who has died or has a family member who has died? Right? How often do you visit them when they're sick? Right? So what types of good deeds are we involved in? What type of acts of worship are we involved in? So all of these are examples of words that are connected with what we call al-bir. That's al khayrat And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He resurrect us among the abrar. And this is why we find in the Quran that Allah he says of the abrar, in the abrar al naim The abrar, they are in bliss. And the wicked, they are in a blazing fire. The, the abrar are in bliss and the wicked are in a blazing fire. Uh, the record of the abrar is in a place called an aliyin, a high place. So we ask Allah that He places among the abrar, resurrect us among, among the abrar. Allah, we ask you to forgive us and to guide us and to assist us in everything that we do. Oh Allah, please accept our fast. Please accept our, our fasting. See, please accept our prayers. Please accept our charities. Oh Allah, please allow for us to increase our worship and come close to, to, come close to you during this blessed month. And we ask you, Allah, to grant us taqwa and utilize that taqwa to reach the maqam of the and through the bill that we achieve your satisfaction, insha'Allah. Inna Allahu wa malakikatuhu di salluna ala al-Nabi. Ya ayyuhal 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 
ربنا تقبل منا انك انت السميع العليم واصب علينا لا يا مولانا انك انت التواب الرحيم ربنا تقبل منا صيامنا اللهم تقبل منا صيامنا اللهم تقبل منا صيامنا اللهم تقبل منا قيامنا اللهم تقبل منا ركوعنا وسجودنا يا رب العالمين اللهم تقبل منا صدقاتنا في هذا الشهر المبارك يا رب العالمين اللهم تقبل منا قراءتنا بالقران يا القران يا رب العالمين ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشلا ربنا لا تزل قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت وأنك أنت الوهاب إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا إنك جامع الناس يوم لا ريب فيه إن الله لا يخلف الميعاد اللهم اغفر للمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات واغفرنا اللهم معهم بفضلك وإحسانك يا أرحم الراحمين ربنا حبب اللهم حبب إلينا الإيمان اللهم حبب إلينا الإيمان اللهم حبب إلينا الإيمان وزينه في في قلوبنا وكره إلينا كفر وفسوق والعصيان وجعلنا من الراشدين ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار وصل الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أخيار وسلم تسليما كثيرا وسبحان ربك يا رب العزة عما يصفون وسلاما على المسلمين والحمد لله رب العالمين وعليه الصلاة